Welcome to ESC TV 2020-22. We are uh, really uh, uh, honored here to be with uh, Dr. Devaca Pereira, who uh, has uh, presented uh, the results of the REVIVE trial. Uh, and I'd like to first start by asking uh, you to tell us a little bit about the key uh, results of this, this important study that you presented. Thanks, Eric. Thank you for taking the time. So just to summarize, we've carried out a, a randomized controlled trial of 700 patients with severe ischemic cardiomyopathy, which we defined as an ejection fraction less than 35% and extensive coronary disease, but also demonstrable viability in uh, four segments at least that could be revascularized. Patients are randomized to optimal medical therapy or optimal medical therapy plus PCI. And the primary outcome was all-cause death or hospitalization due to heart failure. Now, this happened over a, three, a median of 3.4 years of follow-up in 38% of patients in the medical therapy group, but there was no significant difference in the outcome rate in the PCI group, 37.2%. And that difference was actually seen, the, the lack of difference was seen throughout the trial, from enrollment all the way through to the end of follow-up, that the Kaplan markers are completely uh, superimposed, a hazard ratio of 0 0.99. So I think a, a really clear definitive result showing that PCI does not reduce the incidence of, of all-cause death or, or hospitalization. We also had a really important secondary outcome, which I think we'll probably spend some time talking yep. about, which is left ventricular function. Because you and I perhaps believe that if there is a benefit of revascularization, it's mediated by improvement in left ventricular function. But there was no difference in the change in left ventricular function. It improved in both groups. But at each time point that we looked at, six months and 12 months after randomization, there was no difference in EF between the, between the two groups. So that was interesting. And then, of course, the other major secondary outcome was how patients felt. Quality of life as assessed by the Kansas City Cardiomyopathy Questionnaire. Now, this is slightly different in that it did favor PCI for six months, even up to 12 months. But as you followed patients up longer, the medical therapy group seemed to have a continual improvement in their quality of life so that at 24 months, there was no difference. So those are the, the headline results. But I think there are many uh, questions that remain obscured in those headlines, which maybe we can discuss. Well, first of all, congratulations uh, again for this wonderful, important study that you've presented. Uh, let's explore a little bit of what you've what you just been described, the issue of the choice of patient selection. Uh, on one hand, it was very important to highlight that the patients had extensive coronary disease, um, including many patients with left main disease, um, uh, but uh, all patients had to have uh, demonstrable viability as per the site assessment, which was done in over 70% of patients by CMR. Right. Could you speak to me to that, why you chose to define the population that way, and what do you think the implications of that choice are in the findings that you've now shared? Sure. So really, we uh, set out to enrich the population for those in whom we thought we could show a benefit. And the, that thinking goes right back to the original description of hibernation. You know, people believed that there had been adaptation to to you know, repetitive ischemia when there was an improvement after bypass surgery. And so it's really ingrained in our, in our psyche that the mechanism of benefit is improvement in, in LV function. Uh, or conversely, that if we are going to show that the benefit in anyone, it is those patients who are likely to improve LV function. So hence, the, 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 that inclusion criterion, 25% or so of the entire myocardium needed to be dysfunctional at rest but have the potential for recovery, and those particular segments ought to uh, be feasible to revascularize by PCI. So that's, that's what we, we, why we, we included that. Uh, I suppose we can't comment on what the results might have been if we also allowed patients who had more extensive scar, and what the, what the, the benefits of revascularizing partially or, or transmurally scarred myocardium might be, but I think as our knowledge base um, existed at the time Revive started, this was perhaps the best way to almost stack the decks in favor of revascularization. If it was going to work, 
you'd show it in this population. Yeah, stacks the deck uh, in favor of PCI uh, as a meta method of evaluation. Right. Yeah. So let's let's uh, follow up with maybe tell us a bit about the results um, that to me were quite surprising um, around the lack of reduction in uh, MI uh, uh, among patients who uh, were randomized to PCI versus medical therapy alone. Um, were you surprised, and, and can you tell us a little bit about how that, uh, ev the event rate, as well as the types of MIs that you evaluated? Yeah, so the, the secondary outcome we're talking about is uh, all types of myocardial infarction uh, during follow-up were no different between the two arms, but actually they were made up of very different types of myocardial infarction that occurred at a different point from randomization. In the PCI arm, the majority of those were periprocedural myocardial infarctions, whereas in the, uh, the medical therapy arm, they were almost all spontaneous myocardial infarctions. And from just that statement, you'll know that there had to be a difference in spontaneous myocardial infarction over the course of the trial in favor of the PCI arm. If you were to magnify out our curves extensively, you might liken them to the curves seen in the ischemia trial, where there was a crossover, there's an excess of, of periprocedural infarction, but a gain in reduction in spontaneous myocardial infarction. But I, I haven't emphasized that too much in our presentation or the, the publication because the numbers were really low. These are secondary outcomes. And when the primary outcome is negative, we have to be cautious about doing more than hypothesizing over secondary outcomes. Sure. So, so one question that will um, many of our audience probably has, and, and uh, uh, may be unfair to ask either of us to discuss, but it, I think it's going to be out there, which is the comparison between the different modes of revascularization for which we now have some data versus medical therapy in these low EF patients. And can you um, speak to what, um, our expect, what we've learned from these studies now related to the mechanisms of, uh, uh, un at play between a percutaneous approach to revascularization versus a surgical approach? And do you think that that might explain some of the distinctions that we've seen? Yeah, I mean, I think neither you nor I are going to be, get, going to be able to get away from this comparison between revived and stitched in the coming weeks. Everyone's going to be asking that. I think it's a difficult, um, there are two difficult tri trials to compare because to an extent we are comparing apples and oranges. The surgical patients who went into stitch, and you know this better than I do, were those who were deemed to have a, or predicted to have a good outcome from surgery. And one of the big differences was that it was a younger patient population. And we recruited patients who had a mean age of about 70, whereas it was around 60 in stitch. Okay. So that already is showing a fundamental difference. Uh, and comparing those populations is difficult because of that difference. But also, and we know this from all the other comparisons of PCI and CABG that have been done in the preserved LV function population, that they do different things. We treat a lesion that is deemed to uh, be hemodynamically significant with PCI, whereas you bypass an entire segment of disease which includes that lesion and therefore theoretically may protect patients from myocardial infarction that might occur at any point in that artery at that tight hemodynamically significant lesion or elsewhere. So that might be one of, one of, the, one of the differences. But there is also a really important difference that's very pertinent to this particular population. And this is where the viability question comes back in. With PCI, it is possible to target the specific region that, that uh, was found to be viable. Whereas in STITCH, although that wasn't a mandated part of the protocol, as I understand it, it was a gateway to going into the trial. And once you went into the trial, the surgeon very likely, once they had a patient who had entered the trial, would bypass everything that they could find, whether it's subtended viable or non-viable myocardium. So in there are some real differences in what CABG does at a vessel level, what the cumulative amount of revasc and types of revasc that were done at a patient level, uh, that will mean that there are differences. Ultimately, if we are to answer this, we probably need to compare CABG and PCI in the, in the same cohort. Yeah, I, I would agree with you, and I look forward to, to uh, working with you potentially to do that. So follow up to that. The issue will come up, um, and you touched on it briefly in your presentation, but if you could expand on the issue 
of how you evaluated the um, the 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 percutaneous revascularization that you performed or your investigators performed um, in terms of completeness of revascularization versus incomplete. Um, we didn't see that data in, yeah. in the presentation, uh, but maybe you are in the midst of those analyses or maybe presenting it already in the manuscript, which we haven't seen, sure. at least I haven't. So what I can share with you at the moment is center reported uh, completeness of revascularization. So as they believed that uh, they had achieved, uh, the, the patient started with a BESIS Jeopardy score of around 9.5 or 10, and on average there was about a, a 6 BESIS Jeopardy score reduction. And that translated to a completeness of revascularization of about 70% or upwards. But that's anatomical completeness of revascularization, not functional. So there was no mandate to reopen CTOs or treat vessels that were known to subtend transmural scarred myocardium. So we believe that the functional completeness of revascularization would have been much higher. Nevertheless, if you use the center reported anatomical completeness of revascularization and you divide them by the median amount of revascularization achieved, there was no difference. The hazard ratios are very similar. Um, as you know, the New England Journal are, are 2, allow us 2,700 words, <laughs> three figures, two tables. There's only so much we can put in there. But I urge everyone who is interested to look at the supplementary appendix because we have provided the kaplan meier curves by completeness of revascularization. And actually, there isn't a difference in the, you know, almost completely anatomically revascularized versus the partially. So, so I'm going to ask one more question and open it up to, to our audience um, for a few minutes. So uh, you, you and your investigative team should be congratulated because this is BCIS 2. Uh, obviously, you and your team have worked uh, previously and are working concurrently to evaluate the concept of what I call facilitated PCI in these low EF patients. Can you tell us about the uh, utilization of uh, ex uh, ex accessory um, mechanisms of support in Revivid and whether that could have or would have played a role if they were different? Yeah, no, that's a good question, Eric. So uh, at the moment in the UK, there's very little uh, use of elective mechanical circulatory support for high-risk PCI. Uh, and that's because there is very little randomized evidence to support that, that practice. So that's one, one thing to bear in mind. The overall rate of MCS in Revived was very low, uh, three or four percent. Okay. But it's also worth remembering that Revive was all about the myocardium and not the coronary complexity. So if you had a left main lesion, that was considered really important for your long-term outcome. Whether that was a 111 left main lesion or calcified lesion really didn't matter. So it wasn't weighted for complexity. But we are, as you implied, in the process of trying to answer that question with BSIS-3 which is a trial that includes patients that are very similar to the ones that went into Revive from a myocardial perspective, but are very much more complex from a coronary perspective. And these are patients in whom we would anticipate a very long ischemic time during the procedure, and the risk of hemodynamic compromise would be very high. The patients are being randomized to LV unloading with a transaxial pump versus no unloading. So that's, that's already underway. We, we look forward, at least I do, uh, I think most of our audience will look forward to these secondary analyses, particularly just to highlight, which I won't ask you to comment on right now, the uh, important inclusion of left main patients, of which half, over 50 patients, uh, small number, but uh, were not treated with any revascularization, which is, I think, a unique feature of your study um, yes. and one that I look forward to hearing more about. Maybe with, at this point, I'm glad uh, there's an, um, a microphone in the middle of the room, and if I could ask anyone who would like to ask a question, of the uh, of our uh, of our discussion here, um, please introduce yourself and then ask your question. I'm Swati Mukherjee. I'm an interventional cardiologist from Melbourne, Australia. I'll ask you a question. Do you, I mean, very disappointing for us interventional cardiologists, but I'll ask you a question. Stitch was done in the early 2000s. Heart failure tra therapy has come a long way now. Do you think that's had an impact? Because we are looking at myocardium in this, like you said. Uh, do yeah. you think that, and, and you took only viable myocardium to this study. So do you think that, and that is this cohort where heart failure therapy works the best as well. Do you think that's confounded the findings? It's a, it's a great question. I, 
I don't think the findings are confounded, but we, anyone who's assessing the effect of Revask on uh, left ventricular dysfunction needs to be aware that this is a really rapidly changing field. So just think about the, the time course during which we enrolled patients to revive, 2013 to 2020. No one had even heard of ARNI before that unless they were part of the paradigm trial. And now by the end of it, we've got SGLT2 inhibitors and so on. So at every point in Revive, patients got treatment that was contemporary at that time, but we are now quite a long way from where we were at the start of Revived. And as Eric mentioned in his talk, Revived already was a long way from where Stitch was in terms of medical therapy. The rates of ICD and CRT and so on had gone up. But I don't think it confounds the, the, the findings, it perhaps amplifies it because if medical therapy going forwards is even better than we achieved, then the likelihood that revascularization is going to give you an incremental benefit is even smaller. That's a good point. Thank yeah. you. I didn't think about it like that. Yeah. yeah. As the next uh, person comes up, I just want to make one additional comment, which I completely agree. We have to recognize that these advancements in heart failure therapy and coronary disease therapy will continue, which will reduce the absolute event rate, which will make it harder and actually more important to do large randomized trials of these comparisons. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, I don't think it confounds it, I think it just contemporizes it. It does. Yeah. And I think the only way, sorry, the, the only way we might be able to do these large uh, trials with uh, powered for a smaller uh, effect size is by collaborating across across nations, really. I don't think we can deliver that sort of trial within one nation anymore. Please. Um, Akshay Desai from Brigham Women's Hospital in Boston. So congratulations, really fantastic uh, addition to the evidence. I just had a question about the severity of coronary disease in the trial. And, and uh, part of this is to contextualize for us clinicians, you know, how many of these patients had low LV function and incidental coronary disease, and how many truly had LV function, dysfunction that was a consequence of severe coronary heart disease. And I think the average number of vessels that were treated in the trial was about two. And that seems a little inconsistent with the severity of coronary disease that you sought out to recruit. So sure. how do you reconcile those issues and how do we apply them to the population that we commonly see in practice uh, um, that, that, that we want to apply the results to? Yeah, that's a great question. In fact, embedded in there are a, a few great questions, I think. Um, so the first thing is, did we have a risk of including incidental coronary artery disease uh, where there was a, a cardiomyopathy? And we were very aware of this uh, from the outset and therefore specified a minimum jeopardy score of six. And there, there have been some recent data to show that that's a pretty good uh, predictor of the etiology being, being ischemic. So from the trial inclusion criteria, they were adjusted to minimize the risk of incidental coronary artery disease. But also, as Eric pointed out, the majority of viability testing was by cardiac MRI. Now the unseen benefit of doing a cardiac MRI is while you're trying to assess the viability of myocardium, you also get a really lovely um, uh, idea of etiology. Because if we found patients who didn't have any scar, but had an EF of 20%, and multivessel coronary artery disease, unless you also had ischemia and a perfusion abnormality, you'd wonder whether this was incidental. And 16% of, so let me take a step back. Of all the patients who were screened, we ended up randomizing 24%, which might seem a low number, but anyone who does trials will realize that actually that's a, quite a high conversion rate. Of the 76% who didn't go in, when you look at the reasons for not going in, 16%, one-sixth, were because after doing all of the revived investigations, the operators felt that this was not an ischemic cardiomyopathy. So I think both the inclusion criteria were set up to prevent that from happening, and the operators had yet another chance when going through the checklist to go, whoa, this is not someone who's likely to recover. And so I think we, we, we circumvented that problem, and I believe that we have truly uh, enrolled an ischemic cardiomyopathy population. Great, thank you. With that, we are actually exactly on time. I wanted to thank the audience, and most importantly, uh, Dr. Pereira here for a wonderful presentation.
and uh, uh, yeah, please look forward to uh, further work from ESE TV 2022. Thank you, Eric, and thank you all.